Well, I wanted to open with that style of Japanese drum music because that's eventually where this company of New Home ended up going. It ended up evolving or being absorbed by, depending on which historical accounts you accept as absolute infallible truth, by none other than the Janome Sewing Machine Company which if you never knew it, when you look at the translation of Janome, it means Eye of the Snake. Who knew that? Who actually knew, who actually knew that Janome in Japanese, when you translate it, means Eye of the Snake? So if you own a Janome, you've got a snake machine. You just do. <laughs> but Eye of the Snake is kind of a unique way to name a sewing machine, isn't it? But that's what they did. Now, again, when you Google, when you Google New Home, let's say you Google the history of the New Home Sewing Machine Company, kind of like I did, you get some mixed information on the company. Everyone, when you do different searches, seems to agree that the company started with very, very modest, very humble beginnings, only having about $350 in assets to begin this company. Now, if you own your own company like I do, starting with assets of only 350 bucks and then growing it into a company that becomes world famous, has over 700 employees, that's pretty doggone impressive. Talk about pinching pennies, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's unheard of now, companies being able to start with that modest uh, in the realm of assets and being able to grow into a successful uh, enterprise level company but that's what they did and one account attributes the founding to William Barker and Andrew Clark and that they founded the company out in uh, Massachusetts Every, everyone seems to agree on that as well and the first machine that they made was a single thread New England sewing machine specifically in Orange Massachusetts now, another account given out by another company, see if I can pull it up real quick, gives a very different perspective on the company. Let me come out of this shot a little bit and I'll kind of step into the workshop shot here. There we go. You can still see the the machine and you can see me hopefully eventually and I should mention before I even step into the shot that this machine belongs to a local lady her name is Sherry Malin I hope I'm saying her last name correctly I didn't ask her how to pronounce it uh, it's M-E-I-L-A-H-N L-A-H-N yep Malin so let's just say Sherry let's just say let's stick with Sherry because I'm pretty I'm about 99.9% .9 sure of that and um, she brought this machine in. She's a local lady again. She brought this machine into the workshop. 
to take those off because I'm having a little bit of trouble. The lights are kind of bright right here. I've got LED lights coming straight down on me. Matter of fact, hold on a second. Just remind me to turn that back on. <laughs> So Sherry's a local lady, and she brought this machine in with a number of symptoms. Number one, it would not sew in reverse, period. And I did, um, after digging into the machine, as we'll see on Facebook, I did eventually discover the issues relating to that, which were multifold, and also required a part. And, uh, and then also the machine kept breaking needles. Didn't matter what kind of sewing she was doing. She might be sewing uh, real light cotton materials. She might be sewing heavier grade type materials. And the needle just repeatedly kept breaking, 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 breaking. And I discovered the issue with that as well and resolved that. I'm trying to see if she mentioned anything else. She did mention something that both of us kind of chuckled at a little bit. Uh, not the fact that she got divorced because obviously, you know, there's always mixed feelings in that, in that space. But she got this machine as part of her divorce settlement. And she said, I'm really happy with that. I said, you got a great machine, by the way. And she said this machine was new in 1989. So by vintage definitions, is a machine that's 31 years old considered vintage? Talk to younger people, yeah, you bet it would be. Uh, talk to uh, older folks and, and folks that have been walking the earth longer than this machine has, which includes me, uh, then you would say, well, 31, yeah, I don't think that's really vintage. I don't think that's vintage at all. But my belief again is that every sewing machine has greatness, including some of the machines that are much younger than the other machines you've seen on these workbenches. So I very seldom will ever turn away a machine. And when Sherry came to me with the needs for this machine, I was very glad to help. And, uh, and I'm glad now to be able to get to this finish line point and show off this machine because sh this machine is not only made well, uh, again, uh, new home roots that eventually grew into Janome, Eye of the Snake. So again, you Janome owners, if you've got a Janome, Eye of the Snake, Eye of the Snake, Eye of the Snake. <laughs> I'm not going to let that go anytime soon. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, this machine is now at a point where it can really strut its stuff and show its stuff. But let me, let me first of all give you another account that I discovered when I googled History of the New Home Sewing Machine Company. I also found another account that's very different than the one that I just shared with you about uh, William Barker and Andrew Clark. And uh, I'll read some of that to you. And yes, I've got my cool pink glasses on again. Okay, so this account is put out by my friends at uh, Ismax. And Ismax does some really, really good work uh, in researching and finding out the roots of uh, sewing machines, sewing machine companies, etc. So I'm, I generally put a, I stock a lot of faith in what they write. So here's what they wrote. In the year 1860, Thomas H. White, together with William L. Grout, who lived, uh, Grout apparently lived from 1888 until 1908, were manufacturing chairs at Orange, Massachusetts and at that time knew nothing about sewing machines. They're making chairs and all of a sudden they're going to move towards sewing machines. How interesting, huh? It may have been a window of opportunity. Let's find out. So little sewing machine factories had sprung up throughout New England, many of them to be closed by the combination controlling basic patents while others defended lawsuits brought against them. So this is a booming time for sewing machine companies. They're popping up all over the place, but a lot of them are meeting with controversy, uh, either because they're having to prove or defend the patents that are already in place, protecting certain aspects of machines and how they operate, their functions, their components, etc., and then also getting hit with lawsuits on top of that. White saw a good field in the sewing machine line and that year, he and Grout, with a cash capital of only $350, and with the help of three employees and a lathe, a planer, and a drill press, started to manufacture machines. Talk about bare bones, huh? They opened their plant in a little shop between Templeton and uh, Philipston, Massachusetts, 
and produced a hand-operated sewing machine known as the New England. Grout and W.P. Barker spent most of... Now, see here, we're finally bringing Barker into the picture. Grout and W.P. Barker spent most of their time out on the road selling the machine for $10. White, White's task was to remain in the shop and assemble the parts. Grout uh, severed his partnership with White in 1861 and moved to Winchington, Massachusetts, where he started another sewing machine business. See that? They start with you and then they leave and then they're competition all of a sudden. What's that about? Whatever happened to loyalty? You know what I mean? That's why it's just me, Dr. Singer, Mr. Bean, Herr Obermeister, and His Majesty the King. We haven't brought anybody else into the fold because, I don't know, we got secrets to protect and maybe they're just going to go out and start using our secrets. Maybe they won't. Maybe they will. Maybe they won't. Maybe they will. Maybe they won't. Who knows? And my screen just went dark. So we're going to stop there for right now. But you get the idea. The idea is that this company started uh, very bare bones, very, very simple, very, very plain Jane, if I may use those terms. And they eventually, around the 1980s, 87, according to what uh, Sherry shared with me, uh, they came up with this machine. And this particular machine is a model SL2022. And it's an all-mechanical machine. Even though you'll see when we, t when we go up by the uh, stitch selections, there's a little light that changes as you change stitch pattern selections. And it is lighted, but that's about as far as the electronics go on this machine. It's, it's a very basic mechanical machine, which you know what, quite honestly, it really is in my comfort space as far as what I enjoy working on and what I think generally has a lot fewer issues. Some of these newfangled computerized machines, if they have a single circuit board that goes out, you're looking at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars in replacing that board along with the labor. So with machines like this, you dig into them, as you'll see I did on Facebook, and I only captured a few pictures of what I did to Sherry's machine, but you'll get the idea as you look into this machine with me, it's made well. It's built with the the construction quality that you would expect to find in um, Foff sewing machines, Husqvarna's, uh, and some some Janome machines as well. Again, even Janome means eye of the snake. Not going to let it go, folks. Not going to let it go. <laughs> so even though if you have an eye of the snake machine, a Janome machine, uh, there are many quality attributes of that machine as well. They're still made very well, along with the Jukies, obviously, too. And uh, But let me walk you around Sherry's machine and just point out a couple of things, because there are a little bit of... In, in the way the controls, they're a little bit tricky, is kind of what I wanted to lead into. And I'm going to adjust my lights a little bit, because it looks like it's kind of shadowed on the front of the machine right now. Okay, I'm going to walk you around this machine and just point out some of the uh, controls, because we're going to be using some of these, obviously, during the course of the premiere today. So the very bottom one, this one right here, is what was not working on Sherry's machine before, and now it is. You push it down, and it activates the reverse function of this machine, which does have a little bit of a delay on it, even after I got it working as it's designed to do. It kicks in pretty quick, but it's not instantaneous. Uh, there's just a slight little hesitation by the way the mechanism engages on, on the, uh, the main lower drive shaft. So this is reverse. This is your stitch selector, and it gives you a wide scope of stitches. We'll get up there eventually, and I'll go across those stitches. And a lot of them I've already sewn. Uh, some of them I have not. I just kind of put my clippers there to hold the stitches down because they're kind of puckering up. So stitch selector is pretty basic. That's all it does, that control you see right there, the knob. As we move up the machine, here we're getting into a brain center of controls. And these are the controls that are a little bit tricky. 
because generally if you're looking at a control and I'm actually gonna get closer okay there we go so if you're looking at a control like this center one because these are two separate controls you have the center control and then you have uh, this outer dial that rotates as well now generally if you see numbers like this one from 0 to 4 you're gonna assume that this center one this brown one in the middle is going to be stitch width right 0 to 4 doesn't that sound like stitch width to you it's not on this particular new home this center dial is actually stitch length so that's the first thing you need to understand about this machine is the center dial that goes from 0 to 4 is stitch length the outer dial here is going to be stitch width and the stitch width on this particular machine also gives you some control over needle position too depending on the mode that the machine is in so that's a little bit oddball because normally you would anticipate the outer dial is stitch width the inner dial is stitch length wait reverse that you would normally assume the outer dial is stitch length with numbers going from zero all the way to six and the inner dial would be stitch width with the numbers going from zero to four but on this one again it's opposite stitch length stitch width stitch width stitch length in the center and uh, I, I mean that those those are the basics of the machine right there I mean that's in essence other than let's go buy the stitches and look at those as well I think their their branding is kind of cool don't you the little triangle thingies going into a box kind of zoom in on it a little bit that would be a great quiz question in the future wouldn't it what colors comprise the branding mark of the new home sewing machine from the 1980s of course then we would get debates on what the colors are you know what i mean is it turquoise red kind of an orangey and then a black color or is it you know what i'm saying everybody looks at colors different don't they thank goodness we had bob ross to bring us all into the single circle of just loving each other and having a love for painting so so these are some of the stitches that this machine will uh, put out. You can see almost kind of, a, you know, again, back to eye of the snake, which is what Janome means. You can see kind of snaky patterns on the far end there. Then we go into like block patterns and diamond patterns and kind of a double S pattern. The Super Scott pattern, the one right there on the end. And then we have uh, buttonholes different phases there one two three four we've got what looks looks like a modified zigzag or almost a blind hem and I'll just kind of scroll across these and we'll make up names later as to what these stitches are called but really a pretty impressive scope of stitches wouldn't you agree and again, this is an all-mechanical machine. This is not computerized. Let me come out of this a little bit because I'm going to make you, make you dizzy otherwise. I'm going to set my little paper down. So according to the count, we've got about 22 stitches on this machine. That belongs to Sherry. And I've already sewn a number of them, as you may have seen in the Facebook post. Here's my little light that I was talking about. This is like the only electronic thing about this machine. If I turn the switch off, which is on the right side of the machine, our little light goes off. See that? So the lighting system indirectly contributes to being able to read what stitch selection you're on, which is kind of neat. I'm just going to go over here real quick. So over on this side of the machine, on the right side of the machine, you can see we've got a, a bunch of things going on. Number one, that's where we plug in our power source, which also 
conjointly has our foot controller. And then, like you see on some of the Necky machines, we've got a little switch that allows you to go between low power and high power, which means high speed and low speed. By just sliding that little switch to the front, I can have a version of the slow gear. By sliding it to the rear, I can kick those turbo boosters in and I can fly this machine does have a lot of grit it has a one amp motor which means by by definition as far as power it's got more power than the 201-2 the 1591 more power than a lot of machines that you've seen on this channel not quite as much power as the majority of the um, the FAF sewing machines or the FOF sewing machines as I prefer to say uh, or as the Husqvarna's obviously so these are some of the stitches I already did off camera as I was fine tuning uh, the machine and getting it up to snuff. And I don't know about you, but I think those are pretty doggone impressive. Uh, great clarity of stitch. And no, I didn't use the chrome needle to sew these. I didn't. I didn't use the chrome needle. <laughs> but, but Sherry is going to have a wide selection of stitches that she can choose from. Uh, in sewing any of those 20 plus stitches that are engineered into this machine. So it uh, gives her a lot of versatility no matter what she's doing, whether she's doing applique work, whether she's doing uh, you know quilting or whatever it is. You got some really gorgeous cool stitches uh, on this machine and we're going to re-sew and maybe sew some new ones for the first time uh, during this premiere today so you can hear the machine operate and just really gain an appreciation for the greatness of this machine from the 1980s. Only 31 years old, it's a baby. I mean, especially if you compare it to a machine like the one that I gave to Mary Klein for winning that last contest from 1885 to 1980, whatever I said, 87? Didn't I say 87? Yeah. No, 89, 89. <laughs> More coffee, more coffee. So yeah, from 1885 to 1989, holy mackerel. That's a big span, isn't it? I've got to do the math real quick. And some of you may have already done it because you're mathematicians. Let's see. So if we compare a machine like Mary Klein's from 1885 to Sherry's machine from 1989... 104 years after Mary Klein's machine was made, that 12K hand crank that I gave to her for winning the contest uh, for the Kissimmee, Florida adventure, going down the Bill's neck of the woods. From the time that Mary Klein's machine was made, there was 104 years that lapsed before this machine came onto the scene. Over a century. So that's what does kind of make this machine a little bit of a baby. It's a little bit of a baby. But let's let's do this first of all. I'm going to set some of these controls so we can start by doing a straight stitch. And then we're going to launch into some of the other decorative fun sew-offs. And I've got to get the lights just right because I'm using these spotlight thingies right now and they don't do the grandest of job in highlighting what I'm doing with the dials. So the first knob that I need to change is going to be stitch width and stitch length. I had to check the, uh, the stitch itself that I have it set on right now, which is actually a straight stitch. I'm going to think maybe, maybe I'll angle her machine just a little bit so you can see the stitch selector a little bit more clearly. Let's go up there again and look at that stitch that I have it set on right now. So right now, it's hard to see from this angle, but the one that's lit up is the straight stitch. Uh, this one right here. So we've got it set on straight stitch right now. Actually, I'll move my camera a little bit too. Maybe that'll help. Maybe it won't help. You never know. Yeah, that did help a little bit, didn't it? Sort of. 
depends on where you're at, angle and all that kind of stuff. So now you can kind of see that it's lit up, right? So if we wanted to change to say a zigzag, we would kick the camera is what we would do. If we wanted to change to a zigzag, all right, let me see if I can move this time without knocking the camera tripod over. We would just click that selector knob, one to the right, and now all of a sudden we're on zigzag. Of course we have to do some other changes on stitch length, stitch width to get what we want, but the bottom line is it's very easy to change between the different stitch patterns that are on series machine, the 22 selections that we've got. So I'm going to go back to straight stitch. Now we're going to move over to the other controls. These right here. Yeah, that angle helps a little bit, huh? So again, this machine is a little tricky because that inner dial is stitch length. So depending on what we're wanting to do with stitch length, we've got to turn this inner dial. So I'm going from four to three. I actually want to be on four, but I'm just kind of showing you. And then for stitch length, if I want to do any of the green patterns, which are going to be primarily the buttonholes, then I would move it all the way. Still going. I'll be easier with this hand. I would turn it all the way into this range right here, this green range, uh, to do buttonholes. And you can see if we look at the uh, stitch control panel on top, it's highlighted in green. Wait, where did we go? The whole machine disappeared. That was scary. The whole area up here in the buttonhole region is highlighted in green as well. So green and green. But we're not going to be doing buttonholes. So I just showed that to benefit Sherry because she said she's still kind of learning uh, this machine. I'm going to turn my heater off. It started out really cold this morning and now it's getting too warm in the workshop. I think I'm used to working in sub-zero temperatures down here and when it gets above 60 some degrees I'm all of a sudden like holy mackerel it's it's a heat wave down here. So again we're going to be doing a straight stitch so I'm going to move this selector in the middle for stitch length from buttonhole region over here all the way back to number four, all the way back to number four. And then I'm going to move the outer dial. Again, the inner dial is stitch length. The outer dial is stitch width and also controls needle position. So I'm going to move that outer dial. I had to flip my screen around. I'm going to move that outer dial all the way down to zero for uh, stitch length for stitch width. Blah, 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 blah. See? See, I'm used to a certain mode of looking at the machine and you got to change, you got to flip your thinking with this with this machine totally. So, so again, I just moved stitch width to zero. I moved stitch length to four. There we go. Moved it to four. Our stitch selector is on straight stitch. And uh, that's it. That's it, really. So I'm going to raise our presser foot, I'll change our camera angle, and we'll buzz down and do a straight stitch on uh, Sherry's machine. Probably do some uh, genuine elk hide just to buzz down that, down and around. It's so quiet in here. I'm probably going to kick on a little bit of music in the background. We'll have some, some drum music drumming while we're drumming here down at the uh, presser foot. All right. So that first tune that we heard that had a, had a kind of a Japanese sound to it, again because New Home eventually evolved or was absorbed into the Janome Sewing Machine Company, Eye of the Snake, which has Japanese roots. Uh, the first one we heard was Spring Thaw. And now we're heading into winter, so that's kind of out of order a little bit, isn't it? 
And now we're going to do Tangled, Tangled. And I'll turn the volume down quite a bit. Quite a bit. Because I'm guessing it's going to start drumming any second now. Okay, so let's go over here and do a straight stitch on Sherry's new home all mechanical sewing machine. And again, this is the model SL2022. Move this foot controller in. I got my slippers on again. Probably not a good choice. They're so doggone comfortable, you know what I mean? Okay, so needle position is at the top, and let's see how Sherry's machine does with a single layer of uh, genuine elk hide. Here we go. Kind of launched into that fast and furious, didn't I? All right, let's turn this. Again, we've got a one amp motor on this machine, so it doesn't hesitate a whole lot. It just doesn't. There we go. The only thing that's a little bit awkward on this machine is the position of the presser foot lever. It kind of goes from left to right as you're raising it instead of up and down on the rear of it which I'm usually accustomed to so you got to kind of get it adjusted on that kind of like the flip of the stitch width and the stitch length controls as well all right let's go down to the finish and we're not going to close the box here we go so I don't know what you heard on your end depending on how you're viewing this premiere but no hesitation uh, at all on the part of this uh, new home sewing machine. Again, from the 1980s, one amp motor, uh, and it just buzzed through a single layer of elk hide, just so, like it was a light cotton. I barely had the foot controller pressed down, and it just went brrrm, done. So, a lot of reserve power in this machine if you're looking to do heavier grade sewing. I didn't ask uh, Sherry specifically the type of sewing she's looking to do. Again, she's still kind of getting familiar with this machine. And that's why we're going to cover a lot of the basics on this machine, just so she's really comfortable uh, in operating it. And actually, let me grab this thread holder here. And we'll take a look at these uh, stitches on this single layer of uh, genuine elk hide. Kind of curling back today. Our elk hide is getting a mind of its own. There we go, that's a little bit better. All right, let's take a look at these, uh, these stitches. And I can see I never changed the camera angle, so you didn't even see that, did you? Well, you're seeing it now. <laughs> see that when I get preoccupied with Eye of the Snake, the meaning of Janome? I just get sidetracked all over the place. Those are gorgeous stitches, folks, don't you agree? The stitch formation, uh, the stitch presentation, the stitch alignment. Absolutely spot on. And again, this is like sewing the equivalent of a belt. If you look at it from the side, uh, this is probably about four, almost five ounces of elk hide. Oops, I probably don't have the camera locked, do I? Nope. So if you're new to this channel, this is what, where's, where's the screen? Where's the screen? Oh my gosh. There it is. Finally, there's what we just sewed through. So you can see the thickness straight away. That is like sewing a belt, literally. And this uh, new home just buzzed through it with no difficulty, laid down stitches like that. And now we're going to look at the lock stitches on the back. I'm going to try to look at the lock stitches.
I got some real happy elk hide here. It's just curling all over the place. Maybe it's reacting to that eye of the snake thing or whatever that I said about the, the uh, Janome sewing machine company. So here's our lock stitch that we just did. Single layer of elk hide. Uh, and it's absolutely spot on. I would do a little tweak and increase upper tension so that through this nap we would get even clearer definition of those lock stitches. But all in all we did really really well with the current tension settings in getting a, a stitch that presents extremely well. You can see right now our tension is not set super high. Uh, we can go all the way up to nine and we're only at five which according to their settings is just about optimal setting right around mid-range. So we could tweak that up a little bit if we wanted to to uh, get more definition, more pop out of these lock stitches. But uh, all in all, we're getting a real good um, stitch presentation through these lock stitches. And the top stitch is absolutely spot on. Uh, I'm loving that a lot. So it really comes down to personal preference and whether or not you're going to be making a product or a gift or whatever that's going to be more dependent on a top stitch that presents with a lot of pop or the lock stitch or maybe both and then you might have to look at some subtle uh, adjustments but I wouldn't recommend adjusting much at all as far as that top stitch it is balanced just beautifully right now so that bobbin case down in the raceway is doing a, a excellent job right now in presenting this top stitch and again, if we want to tweak that lock stitch, we'll just go up to that upper tension, bump it up just a little bit when we're doing leather sewing. And then when we resume sewing to other materials, we can always bump it back down a little bit. Does that make sense? So that's a definite pass on Sherry's machine, this uh, single layer of uh, genuine elk hide. I'm going to throw that to the rear. And I think what we'll next, next do is... I think we'll go ahead and do some uh, commercial grade canvas. And I'm also going to put out a little bit more music and also drink a little bit more coffee, which I think I need because my tongue is not cooperating with me too much. This is fun. We'll turn this up while I'm making this transition. If anyone else is a coffee drinker, uh, and not opposed to coffee drinking, type it in the chat, would you? So I don't feel like I'm alone here taking a little break with this drum music to suck down some coffee. Would you? So I don't feel alone, please? Type in the chat, put a smiley face, or put a yep, love coffee, or whatever you want to type would be great. Thank you. Mr. Bean, I know you like music. I do too. Are you pretending like you're drumming or are you just dancing? All right, well, I actually have the camera pointing down at the uh, press your foot this time, so maybe you'll be, be able to actually see the sew off. Wouldn't that be refreshing? <laughs> and you can see I, I actually started with a full uh, bobbin, and I did a lot of off-camera sewing. See it? See how low it is? It's about midway, because I did all of that uh, decorative sewing that you saw at the outset. All right, let's do some uh, commercial grade canvas now. I'll turn down our drum music reluctantly. All right. So I think we're going to do six layers of this uh, commercial grade uh, canvas. Again, I'm not concerned about showing the max of this machine. I want to demonstrate stitch quality and also the versatility and the wide field of, of sewing materials that we can put underneath the presser foot 
and have success with this machine. So here we've got two layers that we're starting with. I'm going to fold it in the middle, getting us up to four. I'm going to fold it again, getting us now up to six layers of uh, commercial grade canvas. Again, I would rate this actually a little bit higher than the U.S. Army grade canvas uh, as far as uh, the punch through factor of trying to get through it. Uh, I mean, piercing this stuff is not easy at all. But I think Sherry's machine, after I've gone through it, will do a very, very good job for us. And I'm just going to buzz straight down the middle. Uh, actually, no, I can go down and around. we got time. I'll go down and around. And uh, who knows, we might even close the box. We might. No guarantees. And actually, I can move that to the outside a little bit more. There we go. Okay, so six layers of commercial grade canvas with this model uh, SL2022 made by New Home in the 1980s. Uh, and uh, we'll see how, see how she does with this sew off. Not easy at all. Let's see, take up arms all the way up. Here we go. And I'm going to try to, uh, when I go through the remainder of this saw off, I'm going to try to really meter out that power. Because right now I have it set on, I think I have it set on high. Let me take a look. Yeah, I have it set on high. I can move it down to low, but I'm going to try to control it with the foot controller. It's got a decent foot controller, and we'll see if we can meter it out that way. Here we go. All right, and now down to the finish. Here we go. Kind of was debating if I'm going to close it or not. I don't know. Let's see here. Just kind of rotate that around. Okay, we'll close it. Here we go. I actually went too far. <laughs> I closed the box and then some. Hey, all right. All right, let me clip these threads and we can take a look at these stitches as well. Again, we just went through six layers of commercial grade canvas. I know a lot of machines that would not be able to do this so off, especially with this level of ease that Sherry's machine uh, just did the task. It just, I mean, no effort whatsoever. Again, one amp power motor. And I went through the motor, obviously, as well. And uh, it did just a spectacular job with this so off. And let's, let's look at the stitches. I think how easily it got the job done is one part of the equation what kind of stitches it laid down, that's the other part of the equation. And I think that you'll be equally impressed with that. Aren't those fabulous? Absolutely spot on. Spacing the formation. I almost feel like I'm the guy that's announcing the dive. The difficulty on this dive is a 8 out of 10. He's going to be doing a double pike turn. And look at the totality of those stitches. Aren't they fabulous? Imagine that as a top stitch on your product or on a gift that you're preparing somebody for the holidays for Christmas. They would be so impressed. You send me a gift with stitching like this, I'll be so impressed. Now let's take a look at the lock stitch. Again, when we did the leather, when we did the elk hide, I was suggesting that we could tweak that upper tension just a little bit to make that lock stitch pop more. But when we're just doing six layers of canvas, commercial grade nonetheless, uh, we don't need to do any tweaking. That lock stitch is just absolutely spot on. Maybe just a little bit of a, a sign of we could maybe bring it up a slight bit to get absolute consistency. But all in all, 
that uh, that lock stitch from a tension standpoint is set exactly where we want it so again lock stitch top stitch if they're almost if it's almost impossible to discern which is which your machine is doing an excellent job for you an excellent job so there's our top stitch and our lock stitch and they really I mean if you look at them they're basically indistinguishable between the two yeah I think I would increase the upper tension just a hair again look at the, look at what we just sewed through six layers of commercial grade canvas so yeah I would probably tweak the upper tension up just a hair kinda like the leather I'm gonna do that right now I'll increase it just slightly just give those uh, this is this are a lock stitch again just give that lock stitch just a little bit more pop but that's a definite pass definite pass with this uh, model SL 2022 so so far we've done elk hide we've done uh, commercial grade canvas six layers of that what should we do next we could probably move into some of the decorative sew-offs because I've I've done a ton of those already too. Let me show you those again up front. And then maybe we can look at these and, and somehow pick one that I haven't done yet. <clears throat> Let me drop this camera down and we'll take a look at these. So these are only a small number of the stitches that are available on Sherry's uh, new home. And when we go up to the stitch options I'll see if we can't find one that we didn't do here yet already if I end up duplicating it I duplicate it also I didn't show you the top opens over here on Sherry's machine I'll just kind of lock it right there and there's a nice little chart up here that uh, gives you some quick reference recommendations Kind of point my lights that way. It gives you some quick reference recommendations for everything from buttonholes to uh, decorative stitches, and it gives you some suggestions as far as setting uh, uh, thread tension, uh, width, length, uh, the type of foot that you ha should have on the machine when you sew that particular stitch. I'll kind of come right out to here, and we'll just kind of go across it. But these are a lot of the questions that people will have, not only once they first get a machine, but even after they've had that machine for a while, these questions will come up. And New Home is thoughtful enough, especially with some of these more desirable uh, fashion type patterns that the machine will sew, it gives you a quick reference like this so that you're able to set yourself up for success and set the machine up for success so you don't get frustrated as you're trying to make one of those selections and the machine you know according to you isn't doing what it's supposed to be doing also on top here there's a little tray right here with some of those feet I don't know if I'll be able to get my big fingers in there here I'll come off the tripod because if I try to get my big finger in there it's gonna be hard to pull it out But a lot of thoughtful design has gone into this uh, machine with the owner in mind to make their life easier, to make it more fun, to make it less problematic, to, uh, to make it more exciting. There we go. So obviously here uh, is your bobbin winder. To engage it, you just slide it to the side and then eventually it will fill. Uh, I actually wound this bobbin um, in getting ready because I never use the thread that's in the machine. I always pick my own thread uh, and uh, it disengages beautifully when it gets to a certain fill point. I probably would adjust it a little bit just so it would fill a little bit more and that's what that set screw is right there. You can adjust how far this little uh, spacer is, is pushing out uh, so you, won't, you would want to draw it in closer to the body of the machine if you want to be able to 
uh, fill that bobbin more full and then it won't disengage uh, quite as quick. But if you're uh, winding a bobbin, you put your bobbin here obviously, you're going to come around uh, this thread guide right there. I should say thread tensioner is what it technically is. And you come through this little thread guide right here. You'll actually come, see where that little V is right there? Let me zoom in on it. You'll actually come in the, the little um, opening where that little V forms right there. So right in that little space right there is where you'll go when you're winding a bobbin. And then you'll come all the way back across uh, to the bobbin itself to wind. So just basically, I'll widen the shot so I don't make you dizzy. It's basically from here to here to here back to here to wind a bobbin. And then threading the machine is not too difficult either. And they, they make it real easy uh, because they want to set you up for success again. So right on the inside of the faceplate, similar to some of the other machines that I've shown recently, we have a quick reference threading diagram. So you can see coming off the top of the spool, which mounts uh, sideways in this machine. See that? Mounts sideways. And I should mention as well that you're going to want to have the thread uh, coming over the top when you slide the spool on. There's two ways of doing it. If you flip this spool the other way, the thread is going to be coming off the bottom and feeding. If you have it facing this way, the thread is going to be unwinding off the top of the spool. And according to the owner's manual, you want it unwinding off the top of the spool when you slide this into position. Okay. So again, if we're looking at that threading diagram, you come off that spool, and they actually show it there too. See how it's coming off the top? Whoops, you almost saw it coming off the top instead of if it were the opposite way they would show that thread coming off the bottom but it's coming off the top then you go through that same little thread guide and it's a little tricky because there's a spot right underneath let me see if I can come in on it see there how there's a little come on camera see how there's a little opening down there you have to kind of slide the thread past that little piece of metal that you can kind of see in the shot you slide it down there so the thread, when it's feeding and you're sewing, is going through that little opening right there. Then you come over the top. You're going to go around that same. You're going to go around that same uh, tensioner that we will when we wind a bobbin. You then come past this little roller right here. See how we came came alongside of that roller? No, you didn't, because I just moved the camera. We came across that roller. And then we come down this track to go between uh, the tension discs on the left side of this. Come down to the bottom of here. We go around the bottom of this so that we come up through the uh, take-up spring. The take-up spring is actually underneath this little casing. We then come up to the take-up arm. And uh, then you come back down away from the take-up arm. And you come through this thread guide. There's another thread guide right here. Where am I? There I am. There's another thread guide right there. And then there's another thread guide that, almost like that recent one where I showed with the 401 and someone sent me a note, thank you so much for showing that, because I never knew that I had to thread through that one too. See that? Right there. You have to slide it from the back so that it comes down through the front. Right there. That's the final threading point before you go through the needle, which on this one is going to be from front to back. Okay? So hopefully that's helpful. And here on the inside of the faceplate, you've got a lot of service points that have to be dealt with. Um, but beyond that, you also have, if you want to be sewing and you don't want this light on, let's say it's producing a lot of heat, which it will be. Uh, this... This won't take the type of uh, LED bulb that I have. They certainly make LED bulbs that screw in like this, but this one uh, is just a standard incandescent. But it's got this cool little switch right here. So if you want to shut the light off, let's say you have auxiliary LED lighting and you don't want to produce all that heat, just click it off 
or click it on. It's up to you. Very thoughtful design, again, on this machine. And listen to the quality of that when it closes. Again, this is a, a machine from the 1980s, 31 years old, that we oftentimes would say, that's not vintage, that's not quality. Listen. They really built this machine well. They really, really did. Um, I don't know what else Sherry got out of the divorce, but this was a good prize to get as a result of that event in her life. All right. So let's move this to the side. Um, we're going to do some decorative sewing now, and since I'm off the tripod, I might as well uh, do it now as far as the settings. So we could start all the way over here. Uh, again, I'm, I'm looking at my bobbin down here, and I don't have a heck of a lot of thread left. And I'll certainly probably wind, rewind the bobbin before I give this to Sherry. She's going to be picking up today. So I've got to be mindful of that and getting ready for her arrival as well. So let me do this. I'm going to widen this shot a little bit. I guess I am as wide as it'll go. Oh, weird. Okay. So I'm going to change the stitch pattern. We're on straight right now. We're going to go... I'm just trying to remember which ones I already did. Okay. I think I'll do this one on the far left. Way over there. So let's click that way. Some of these I already did, I think. I'm pretty sure I did, yeah. So we'll do this one to start. And then we'll jump all the way over to the other side. And we'll probably do a few of these as well. Just trying to see which ones are real super cool. That, that one's always a cool one, the catacomb one. So maybe we'll do one, two, three, four. I don't know. We'll do some of these over here. We'll do this one. And we'll do the catacomb one over there. So now we need to make some adjustments. We've got the stitch selector correct to do this stitch that we want. I almost call it kind of a leafy thing. But now we need to change these selectors. Our stitch width is okay. Uh, excuse me, I'm pointing at the wrong one. Our stitch width has to go from zero. See, I, I did it again. I'm always used to stitch width in the middle. Stitch length, stitch width, stitch length, stitch width. Stitch width, stitch length. See, it works as long as you say it repetitively and you change your habit from, well, that's always stitch width. Well, it's not on this machine. It's stitch length, okay? So <laughs> we're going to take stitch length way down from four for this decorative pattern all the way down to about one. So I'm going to make that adjustment right now. There we go, right about almost down to one for our decorative stitching. Now our stitch width, we need to now take it from zero because we were doing a straight stitch before, remember? We now need to take it all the way back up to the maximum. I'm just gonna double check that. It's a little bit tricky because when you turn one knob, sometimes it, it turns the other one a little bit uh, as well. So I'm going to move that. All right, let me set the camera down. This thing is being silly. Hold on a second. Aha! I won. <laughs> See that? It's a good thing when you're sewing and stuff, you're not always holding a camera because that would make life difficult. So the settings that I've done to do this stitch, and we'll use the same settings for all the other stitches, is we first of all chose it with a selector, which is down here. We then adjusted our stitch length in the middle down to almost one. Then we moved our stitch width all the way up to the maximum on six. So stitch width, six. Stitch length right around one. And then we chose our stitch by adjusting the selector. Okay? So let me go back to the uh, tripod and we'll sew off these next decorative stitches using uh, Sherry's machine. Now 
what else do I have? No, I think my internet went out. Doggone it. Maybe not. I may have already played this one, but it's kind of cool. I'm just going to turn the volume down. This also makes me think of Hawaii as well, doesn't it? Doesn't it you? The kind of music you'll hear during the different special gatherings on the beaches and stuff. Could come in a little bit closer even. There we go. So again, we've already done a ton of these decorative sauce, but we'll do a few more uh, just for fun. And so you can see this machine operating uh, in this mode as well. You've already seen it buzz through uh, elk hide. Now we're going to see it do some other decorative type sewing. I'm just going to check all of my settings, make sure that we're set up for success. So our stitch length is on one, stitch width on six. Our selector is chosen. All right, let's do this. Here we go. Just change my lights a little bit. Like I said, I have slippers on, so I really punched it there initially. <laughs> And stop. Oh, bummer. I stopped in the down position. Oh, well. Yeah, I'm looking at my thread. I don't know how many more of these we're going to be able to do. <laughs> this is a beautiful stitch that we chose. It really is. It's just super. You can hear how smooth uh, Sherry's machine is running, too. It's not a clanky type sound that you might expect from a machine from the 80s. You know, again, we, are, we do have a little bit of a snobbery when it comes to vintage machines. You know, a machine that's only 31 years old? Yeah, I don't know if that qualifies. Well, it de definitely qualifies after being on my workbench, and it, it is doing just a spectacular job. So that was our first decorative stitch off. Now we're going to leave all the settings the same. We're going to leave all the settings the same, but we're going to change our stitch selector to our next stitch, which is that catacomb type stitch that I talked about. So give me a second here. And again, whenever you're making changes to a stitch selector like this, make sure that uh, you have the needle clear of the material. Okay? So our next stitch is that catacomb type stitch that I already showed you. It's going to be pretty much, let's see if I've got it over here. I don't think I did that one yet. Maybe I did. But here's the catacomb type stitch that we're going to do next on Sherry's model SL2022. Get that take up arm all the way up. Here we go. And I'm going to take this a little bit faster just so you can see that you can also run this at a higher rate of speed and still get great quality from this machine. Ah, I'm down again. What is it with that? I cannot end in the up position. Yeah, so there you can see it kind of in the shot. That's our catacomb one that we just did. We did the first one, kind of the leafy pattern, and now we just did the catacomb with uh, Sherry's model SL2022. So let me do this. Let me go ahead and clip these threads, and we'll jump into a few more uh, decorative sew-offs. Yeah, Sherry's machine only came to me with two bobbins and the other one is full with a black thread that I think she uses quite a bit so I was reluctant to take the thread off of that bobbin too because again whenever you're starting with a machine you always want to start with fresh thread doesn't matter if the machine is right out of the box I always put fresh thread on it and a fresh needle so you know what you're starting with so uh, I only have the one bobbin to work with, 
and we're getting we're probably down to about 30 percent of the bobbin left approximately so now let's jump over to the other side of the stitch patterns the first stitch pattern we did was number one on Sherry's machine we just did number six and now we're going to go all the way to the other side of the uh, stitch selector field and we're going to lay down some of these uh, fancy dancy stitches I think the first one we'll do is uh, stitch 18 and then we'll do stitch 20 last 18 and 20 and I'll show these a little bit slower as a matter of fact I'll flip uh, Sherry's machine over to slow gear and uh, we'll sew these last two patterns, pattern 18 and pattern 20, uh, using uh, Sherry's slow gear or power down bit, uh, button, whatever you want to call it. All right. All right. Let me get that take up arm all the way up. And here we go. This again is pattern 18. kind of see it uh, reduces the uh, power but it doesn't really slow the machine down significantly so it's really more of a power down button than it is a slow gear but it's still it's a wonderful feature to have on the machine obviously and again any of these patterns that I'm sewing you can always do uh, even a further tweak on that stitch length and get a very different outcome from what I'm getting. That's the beauty of uh, stitch patterns is with a few tweaks, you know, whether it's, uh, and again, the book will always give you recommendations, which sometimes I follow and sometimes I don't. Uh, but you can always tweak that uh, stitch width and stitch length and get a very different look very different from what I'm getting right now. You can see these in the camera. As a matter of fact, for these last, for this last pattern we're going to do, which is pattern number 20 on Sherry's machine, uh, I'm going to take that stitch length even just a little bit shorter. Just a little bit shorter. And we'll see what impact that has, if any, uh, as far as the way that stitch pattern presents. Okay, so this is stitch number 20 on this model SL2022. All right, here we go. I'm going to slow it way down. Oh, hold on. should have like an auto shut off as soon as the camera starts rolling it'll shut off the air compressor but I don't have it all right so we're back to this pattern pattern uh, oh son of a gun I was so distracted oh golly okay so I started to re-sew the same pattern again okay so let me change in midstream here we're gonna have a weird looking pattern it's gonna start out with pattern 18 and then it's gonna go into pattern 20 which is what I wanted to so I'm just double checking yep pattern 20 so the needle is clear of the material I'm making the stitch selection now which I didn't do before and now we're gonna finish off this stitch line we started with pattern 18 which we already sewed and now we're gonna finish this stitch line with pattern 20 alright here we go slow it way down See, I'm doing that with the foot controller. It's not because it's on the slow gear right now or the slow power down button thingy. So the foot controller does allow you to meter out that power very nicely on this machine. Well, I deserve to end in the down position that time after starting with the starting to repeat the same stitch I already did for goodness sakes but we got it right in the end and that's a gorgeous stitch right there it's kinda of my building block stitch you can see that in the shot and it's actually good that I have a position like this in the camera right now because you can see it and it looks like I did the whole thing like that which you know I didn't 
So, <laughs> all right. Yeah, our thread's getting real low. We got we got a ways to go yet, if we wanted to. But we've really shown a lot of what this machine can do, and just how beautifully it sews. Again, a machine from the 1980s. And if I said the date wrong, I think it's 89 is what Sherry told me. 1989. So almost almost a machine into the 1990s. And it was very well made, and it sews uh, beautifully, as you've seen. So the last thing, what, what will we do? I could try to redeem myself and actually do another stitch pattern and actually do the whole line the same stitch pattern. Wouldn't that be a hoot? Let's see, what can we do? Why don't we click it one to the left? I don't know that I did this one. Actually, I don't think I did 21 or 22 either. So the first one we, the first ones that we did was pattern one, then we did pattern six, then we did pattern 18, then I started to do pattern 18 all over again, and I said, oh shoot, and then I did pattern 20. So now we have 19, 21, and 22. I'm going to try to do one of the, again, Janome means eye of the snake, right? Let's do the one that looks snaky. I'll turn it one click, two clicks to the right, excuse me. I'll do two clicks to the right, and we'll lay down this pattern. I haven't sewn this one yet, I know. I haven't done it yet. So let's see what this one looks like. Let me take that take-up arm all the way to the top, and we'll try this one out. And this will be our final decorative stitch. We could do a lot more, but we've already done them off camera, and I want to leave something for Sherry to try as well, which will be fun. So here we go. Position. Yes! Ha <laughs> The final stitch. I finally did it. Finally did it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that's awesome. Let me rotate this around. Oh yeah, that's a fun one, isn't it? You can't even see the totality of it because we're only seeing the very top edge of it, but that is a real fun one. I'm glad I did that one. I'm glad I finally did that one. That's a fun one. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. That would be a fun one to do again and again and again. All right, let me clip that. I'm going to put on a little bit more of our drum music to signify the eventual direction that uh, New Home went, becoming part of Janome, Eye of the Snake. All right, here's another drum sound. I'm going to turn the music up a little bit. Are these steel drums? Is anyone real knowledgeable about drums? Are these are these steel drums? Is that what I'm hearing? Oh yeah, I like that a lot, don't you? Those are beautiful. Those are all the ones we just did. And I did a lot more off camera. Absolutely spectacular. Well, I'm going to show you the wide scope of stitching that we did on this machine. Uh, and we could have done a lot more stitching, obviously. We could have done a lot more. Also a real, uh, I didn't show this to you yet, to come out on this shot a little bit. Huh. 
<laughs> that one light is blocking as usual. So this is the manual that came with Sherry's machine. It's not one of those tiny little manual manuals like you'll see with the Singer ones that the printing is almost microscopic. It's real tiny. Uh, this one is printed uh, in a large enough format, whether it's the uh, images or whether it's the text. It's just a whole lot easier to read. It's a lot more friendly. And I've done some reprints on manuals uh, as a resource to customers. And uh, I've also printed them in a larger format. As we get older, and even as we're younger, it's just sometimes a lot more easy if you're working on a project and you're saying, well, how do I do that again? Or what do I need to do? What foot should I use with that? Uh, you know, what should the stitch and width settings be? This is just a lot easier to use this as a reference and as a tool than some of the teeny tiny little manuals where you almost feel like you need a microscope. So again, this is a great plus uh, that uh, Sherry's uh, machine has. And I also forgot to show you as well, we'll look at these stitches first and then I'll take off this little accessory box so you can see also how you convert this very easily into a free arm machine uh, as well. All right, let's take a look at some of these stitches. I guess we'll, we'll go from left to right. We'll look at the uh, al -Qaeda that we did first. Again, just absolutely spectacular sewing on the part of... Uh, I'm plugging my camera back in. I forgot to plug it back in. Give me a second here. This new accessory I have with this camera has just been incredible as far as being able to not constantly be in fear of the camera dying. You know what I mean? And you've noticed the premieres have become longer, which to some is a blessing, to others probably a curse. But to me, it's a blessing because I, I can now apply my creativity, the funness, the learning, and all the other aspects without constantly looking at my watch or looking at the meter on the camera saying, how much time do I le have left? How much time do I have left? Kind of like on this machine now, I can see that bobbin inside of the raceway area and I'm going, oh shoot, the thread's getting low. It's just another stress point that I don't need. But look at those stitches on this elk hide. I'll try to go up as slow uh, as I can. Absolutely spectacular. And again, look at the thickness up there on top of what we just went through. As I put on a little bit more drum music for us, I'm loving this drum music. I don't know about you guys, but I just think it's fabulous. This next one has the word shuffle in it, so let's see if it has a different style to it, the way the music is put together. Absolutely gorgeous stitching. Again, that's a single layer of elk hide, about four or five ounces of chemi chemically processed leather. And here's our six layers of commercial grade canvas. Absolutely gorgeous stitching. Gorgeous stitching. Now we're going to look at our decorative sew-offs. So I'll, I'll kind of look at them like this so we can look at all of them together. But those are all the ones that I did off camera uh, as I was touching, testing and fine-tuning uh, Sherry's machine after I got through repairing and, and uh, doing my process on it. I wanted to test as many of those decorative ones as I could, some of which we, we duplicated today. But that's all fine and good. Uh, the quality of the stitching is just spot on. The lock stitch on these as well is just fabulous. And again, what I sewed on is kind of a cotton blend, uh, two layers of it. So nothing super thick, but it just gave it enough uh, stability that we got some better presentation on those stitches. I think actually better than when we uh, 
used that chrome needle recently on uh, Annette's uh, Husqvarna Viking machine. So needle does play a role, uh, especially when you're looking at stitches that require a lot of needle swing. And uh, certainly these do as you're, as you're executing stitches like this. And certainly the stitches we executed on Annette's uh, CI21A as well require a, a needle that's going to accommodate that. So beautiful, beautiful job. And the ones we did live on camera today are these over here. Which again, I think you'd agree that the, you know, the machine just did a fabulous job. And as I always say, it was not sewing like this when it came to the workshop. It just wasn't. But that's the whole idea of going to a hospital, isn't it? Our workshop is kind of like a hospital. We get machines here that arrive sick, kind of like Sherry's machine. No reverse, breaking needles, having other running issues. And now it just runs, it runs like a dream. It runs like a dream, absolutely. So a couple things real quick I'll show you. And then I also want to do, I, I'm going to just go with a couple more stitches. I want to do a couple more stitches for you. So, and also pull this silly light back that keeps dropping down. Tighten it up a little bit, maybe that'll help. Okay, so what I wanted to show you is, so that was... Uh, Agaduga Shuffle, as best as I can pronounce it. The next one is called Eye of the Snake. I'm kidding, it's not called Eye of the Snake. That's what Janome means. This one is called Cuckoo. Here we go. Cuckoo. Cuckoo, 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 cuckoo. Meister, look at you! <laughs> You're gonna make yourself dizzy! Oh my gosh! Oh, he's going down! He's going down! <laughs> All right, so let me show you how easy it is to make this a free arm machine. I'll move our sew offs to the side, which are absolute successes. I'm so pleased with those. This one I'm gonna leave off front because I might zip down a couple more stitches. We have just enough thread left to get away with that. So right here is our little accessory box, and also you just you just tilt it forward, and now all of a sudden you have a free arm sewing machine. And I have my screen the wrong way, so let me see. Yeah, you can see that. And then in here you can open it up. If I remember how to open it. Oh, open it from the other side. Duh. You can open it up here, and then all of the goodies that you have in here are readily uh, readily accessible. Can't see if you can see that in the light. The lighting is kind of weird right now where I'm standing. But Sherry's got a variety of things in here. She's got lots of screwdrivers and some other uh, feet and just a variety of other goodies. And then it's just as easy to put back in place. You just kind of slide it in, snap it back in place again. So again, I'll say it again. I think that this uh, this new home uh, SL, right? I had to look SL 2022. Uh, has a lot of very thoughtful design features into it that make it so much easier uh, for the owner. Uh, they just are very, very, very clever when it comes to saying we're not going to do just what we want. What we want to do, we're going to do something that is going to benefit, uh, you know, the uh, the owner of the machine. Why don't I show you this again? Just, just what we'll kind of go? Yeah, we'll kind of go like this. I think we'll go like that. So what I wanted to do last is just a, I want to do a straight stitch real short. We did a long one. Uh, so I'm going to do a straight stitch real short. And actually I can zoom in on this even closer. So our stitch selector right now is on one of our decorative stitches, the little snaky one we just did. That's that one right there that I think is just super cool. It's this one, where is it? The bottom one right there, that's the one we just did. I think that is the most awesome stitch ever. It's just fabulous. So now we're going to have to move it all the way back across the board from 22 all the way down to 10. 
which is our straight stitch. So I'm going to go ahead and do that first of all. So you know this takes a little bit longer. It's not like some of the computerized ones where you can just punch something in the screen real quick and boom you're at the next stitch. This one again is it's an all mechanical machine. So you've got to you've got to be willing to make those changes on it uh, to get what you want. So we're on straight stitch now. Now we have to make a couple of adjustments over here, which hopefully I will describe correctly this time. So this again is our control center for stitch width and stitch length. And where is stitch length? Yes, we both got it right this time. Stitch length is in the middle. So right now our, our stitch length is uh, set way down on one. Actually, that's not too far from where I want to be because I want to do a real short straight stitch. But I'm going to go ahead and move it just a little bit uh, to the right, right about to one and a half. And then I'm going to take our stitch width, which is the outer knob. So again, inner knob, this one here is our stitch length. Our stitch width is here. I'm going to move that all the way down to zero. And then you can see my, my inner knob sometimes moves with a little bit, so then I have to kind of, oh no, I didn't want it there. I want it there. There we go. So with that little bit of extra effort, <laughs> now we have our stitch length on about one and a half. We have our stitch width on zero. We have our stitch selector on number 10, which is our straight stitch. And now we're going to lay down a real short straight stitch. I just wanted to do that. So you can see that stitch uh, delivered uh, as well on this machine. All right, are you ready? Take up arm all the way up, here we go. And I ended in the up position, thank you. So here we have a stitch that is pretty much in the satin range. Uh, it is teeny tiny and you didn't even see that. So I'm going to sew it again, doggone it, even if we run out of thread. See that? I was so fixated on that camera setting that I just totally... Blah, blah, blah. But that's what we just sewed. We'll sew it again so you can watch it. See that? Lack of sleep does not make one a good camera operator. If I had a camera operator here with me, I'd be good to go. All right, let's get this to a point where we can do that stitch one more time before I run out of thread. And yes, I'm using my um, Americana quilting thread from Joanne Fabrics, which is excellent thread. It just it seems to be a little bit sensitive to static. And we all know as we move into the winter months that uh, the air gets drier. So there's more static that you have to contend with. And the result is thread will sometimes pick up on that as well. It gets it from the machine. It gets it from our hands. And the result is then uh, it starts to wiggle and waggle and do all kinds of crazy things as we're trying to say, no, 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 I want you to go to the back. I want to come to the front. You go to the back. I want to go to the front. You know what I'm saying. All right. So here we're going to do the same stitch again, but this time you can actually see it. Who knew? Here we go. Slow down. Speed up. Slow down. Speed up. Oh, and I ended in the down position. Doggone it. In absolute consistency both times. Again, both of these are going to be on the stitch length setting on Sherry's machine, right around one and a half, which is getting us down into that satin range. Very, very teeny tiny. We'll take a look at these. Uh, I'll lift it up so you can see it a little bit more clearly. And even though we're quite low on thread, we're still kind of hanging in there. Uh, the spool, uh, it's not quite a class 15 capacity or not quite the capacity of some of the long bobbins, bobbins that go in the uh, 
vibrating shuttle, but it, it holds a decent amount of thread. It holds a decent amount of thread, so you don't have to do a lot of start, stopping and starting between uh, projects when you're working with a machine like this. So let's see if I can, kind of debating this. Yeah, I think that works. That'll work. We'll take a look at these uh, teeny tiny stitches down in the satin range. And one row I did that you couldn't see, the other row I did where you could see it. And both of them are equally outstanding. Again, we're talking about probably close to 20 stitches per inch. So if I flip it around, again, just look at those other stitches, especially that one, the last one we did, which is, why don't we call the last one, the one on the bottom right there, the, the, the snaky one, why don't we call that Eye of the Snake? Let's do that for our friends that own Janome sewing machines so that they can always go back to this premiere and go, Scott actually named a stitch after our machine. It happened right here. So this is our lock stitch. And all in all, I would say it's okay, but I would probably, again, just tweak up that upper tension just slightly uh, to make it pop a little bit more. Yeah, I would, I would punch, the, uh, punch the upper tension up a little bit to make that lock stitch. When you're sewing a real fine stitch like this, there's very little time for that hook to come around. It's got to come around so quickly that uh, the finishing product on a stitch with that level of intensity you can see the, the clarity of these other stitches up here that don't have quite that intensity with the stitches grouped together that tight uh, the lock stitch is defined sufficiently when you get down into that satin range you're very likely going to have to bring that upper tension up one or two numbers so if you're set on five you might want to bring it up to six or six and a half if you're going to be doing a lot of satin range type sewing uh, to get that lock stitch to be, to be defined. Top stitch is fine. The top stitch is going to be controlled again by the pull of that uh, bobbin case down below. Uh, that upper tension is losing the battle a little bit on this super satin type level of sewing. So uh, that would be the simple quick fix. Simple quick fix. All right, so let me throw that to the back as, as well. Actually, I'm going to grab the other ones and we'll go through them again real quick. And then we'll wrap this up. But I've got to wrap it up with some of that super cool drum music, don't you think? I think that stuff is so awesome. And I've got to turn my heater back on. It's getting cool down here now. We're only in the 30s uh, in Wisconsin. And depending on when you're viewing this premiere, uh, we had our first snow on October 26th. Our, fish, our first official snow in Wisconsin came on October 26th. Uh, and temperatures now are pretty consistently at night down in the 20s. Uh, if you're talking about during the daytime, probably up in the 30s, maybe it'll creep towards the 40s. But we are officially in the late version of fall, the early version of winter now. So if you're in a place like Arizona, Florida, California, and you've got like 60 or 70 degree weather, we don't want to hear about it. We don't want to hear about it. Don't send me any notes. Don't do it. Don't send me any notes about how warm it is by you, okay? <laughs> All right. How about some, uh, some more drum music? And this one is called, uh, oh, this is, sounds like an interesting one. Mo Morpho, Morpho Diana. Morpho Diana. I wonder what this is going to be like. Ooh. Sounds like the land of make-believe music almost, doesn't it? All right, let's come out on this shot.
Okay, so the sew offs we did today, single layer of elk hide, absolute success. Six layers of commercial grade canvas, slam dunk. We did all of these decorative sew offs on camera today uh, to include the satin level stitching that we did here on the far left hand side and an absolute pass as far as Sherry's model uh, SL yep SL 2022 I had to look again all these numbers and letters goodness gravy so SL 22 uh, her new home did a fabulous job and then all of these I did off camera uh, fine-tuning the machine and getting it ready uh, for this premiere so you just get an idea of the scope of stitching that this incredible machine from the 1980s right around 1880 uh, right right around 1989 right around 1989 is capable of doing uh, again according to the screen 22 different stitches that it can do and this is an all mechanical machine powered by a 1.0 amp motor that does a fabulous job so sherry i appreciate the opportunity of you uh bringing this machine to the workshop again sherry is a local person to the to the area here brought it some time ago and uh she's a happy girl now other than needing a refreshed bobbin she's ready to rock and roll so come and pick her up Sherry, Sherry, come pick her up now, please. Can you do that? All right, I'm gonna ring the bell. By the time I ring the bell, I want you to be here. Seriously, all right? Are you here yet, Sherry? I can't see you. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for uh, attending another uh, premiere where we could showcase this incredible SL2022 that belongs to Sherry uh, from the great state of Wisconsin. Again, it arrived with a number of issues. And uh, now she's a happy girl. And we have one more thing to do. I almost totally blanked on it. Almost totally blanked on it. Yes, this is the premiere I just did on uh, Annette's uh, CI-21A where uh, this is kind of what my screen looks like when I'm going through and I'm rendering it and I'm just doing different tweaks on the, the video, which I don't do a lot of tweaks. But this is how that opened up if you didn't see it yet. So you're really going to be intrigued by what happens. This is how Annette's uh, premiere opened up. No, it didn't open up like that. Hold on a second. No, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. You silly thing, cooperate. Maybe that's a totally different... Oh, never mind. That's the unboxing. That's a totally different one. I thought that was the one where uh, I entered the wrong code into the uh, Husqvarna cam vault, and all of a sudden it went crazy. Never mind, never mind. That's the unboxing of the machine that uh, I intended for Annette. All right, I'm back, sort of. Let me have some more coffee. Ah, there we go. So these are only a very few shots of some of the process that I took Sherry's machine through. Here you can see I have it kind of tilted back and I've got the side panel and the bottom panel removed because a lot of the areas that have to be addressed are deep inside of the deep inside of the machine uh, and you've got to remove all those different panels there's the motor right there that one amp motor you got to remove all these panels uh, to get to the machine so it can be serviced properly now if you took it to a local service center would they do this would they go to this extent uh, no no, they wouldn't. Not even likely. Not even slightly likely. And here you, are, you can see when I'm working with a machine on the workbench, even though the workbenches have a little bit of padding on them, I always use my pillow 
uh, to cradle that machine so that when I'm leaning it back and working on different aspects of it, uh, it doesn't potentially uh, it doesn't potentially get uh, damaged in any way or something get knocked out of alignment. And no, you're not upside down. Uh, I just took this shot from an angle where it's kind of leaned back so it looks like you're kind of upside down. But there again, you can just see um, the wide selection of stitches on Shuri's machine. Again, not generated by a computer program like a lot of the machines today, generated by uh, the engineering and mechanics uh, of the machine, which is fabulous. So this is that lower main shaft that I was talking about where there were a number of issues going on with it that was affecting uh, Sherry's ability to sew in reverse. And uh, like I said, it's still, the way it's designed, it still has a slight little delay when you activate the reverse, but it does work now. And uh, there was one part that had to be replaced on that. Another little shot of that same area. I spent a lot of time there. These are some of the worm gears uh, on the machine. Uh, not all the machine is metal, uh, but the engineering on the inside of the machine is uh, a very thoughtful design and, and built for uh, durability. And this again is going to be part of the mechanics of the machine that uh, affect uh, both forward locomotion and reverse locomotion, different areas that had to be adjusted and cleaned. There's one of our main shafts coming down right off of the motor. And I have to say that the pulley system on this SL2022 is, uh, is very impressive. The pulley system coming off of the motor going up to the main shaft it's almost characteristic of a FOF design where they have multiple pulleys that are distributing that power so that you have better traction and better launch, launch uh, at the beginning. Um, and you might see a shot of that as well. Again, a lot of these areas just need a lot of uh, detail cleaning. A lot of old caramelized uh, grease on this machine as well that was holding back a number of the functions of it. Here I'm digging into some of that old grease uh, using a dental tool. Just checking the shot to see if you can even see that. Yeah, you can. Using a dental tool to dig into some of those spots that that grease is actually fossilized and is actually restricting the mechanical movement of different key components of the machine. There you can see a real close up of one of the areas uh, that I worked on quite a bit to free that up for movement. Uh, when, you, when you activate reverse, a number of these components right in this area right here have to shift and slide on that main shaft freely. And if you've got old caramelized uh, grease uh, sticking them up, uh, it's not going to work as it's intended to work. This is a key spring right here, uh, one of the springs again that once you're sewing in reverse will help you to return uh, to sewing forward again and I'm cleaning in between the individual spring coils of that spring. That's how detailed my process is. Just more detailed cleaning and you can see that yellow substance right here. Um, that's what happens to grease when it's been on a machine so long that it becomes almost like glue. Doesn't that look, look like glue? That yellow stuff? Kind of a yellow mustard color? Again, when you get into colors, one of you might be looking at it saying, well, that's not mustard, that's not yellow, that's whatever it is. So we, we won't go down that, that rabbit hole. <laughs> but that, that stuff that you can see, the goopy stuff, I think we can all agree that it's goopy. <laughs> but that goopy stuff that you're looking at right there has to all be taken out and whatever's on the surface is only the tip of the iceberg there was a lot of stuff I had to dig uh, out of there in all those little cracks and crevices and that's the beauty of uh, my dental tools is I can reach a lot of those spaces I otherwise would not be able to reach there you can see on the end of the dental tool just a little bit of that stuff 
that I was able to dig out of there. Doesn't that look gross? Whatever color it is, I'm still seeing it as kind of a yellow mustard, but you can type in the chat if you see a totally different color. If you don't see yellow, yellowish type mustard color, and you see something totally, type it in the chat. We'd like to know, and then we'll set you up with an optometrist somewhere near you. Here is part of that tensioning system I was talking about that I think is really an excellent design on this new home uh, SL 2022. It's got multiple pulleys, and you can't see them all in this shot, but it's got multiple pulleys that drive the belts, one over the uh, uh, main shaft coming off of the motor. You can see that one right there. And then there's another one just to the rear of it. Uh, that goes off of another pulley system. But again, what that means, and it's the same reason that Foff designed this technology way back in the 50s, uh, it allows you to have a lot better traction, a lot better positive traction when you're launching in sewing. Even if that take-up arm is not all the way in the up position, which is ideal, you're still going to get generally a very steady, uh, predictable launch because they've designed that pulley system uh, differently uh, and much better. Here I'm just putting the machine back together, I think, in the shots. That's a, that's a capacitor on the machine, and I'm just doing an electrical test on it uh, with the machine plugged in. And the sign of, sign of success that the electrical coming through that capacitor is strong and steady is a bright red light. So that bright red light is, is a, a very reassuring thing to see when you're doing that particular test on the machine. And there is a machine reassembled with no extra parts nonetheless. How cool is that? And, uh, and you can see again that's, that stitch off in front of the machine right there is the one that I did off camera that you saw today as well uh, where I went through a, a wide series of different stitches uh, to test the effectiveness of the work that I had done on the machine. And uh, like I said, the machine is a very happy girl now. Very happy girl. Or a guy. It could be either one. And uh, there's uh, a sampling of those stitches that I did uh, off camera. Again, I think this machine does a fabulous job. It just does a fabulous job. And there's the evidence of the work that I poured into Sherry's machine. And more importantly, there is the evidence, as I've said in a recent premiere, there's the evidence of the greatness of this new home sewing machine. This uh, SL2022. That's an evidence of greatness. Every sewing machine has the capacity for greatness. I've said that multiple times. So that none of you that are Kenmore snobs have to say, well, I, don't, I, I would never have a new home. They're, they're no good. Well, there's the evidence that new homes are fabulous when they're prepared properly. Or if you're a singer, singer snob, you can now see that a new home has incredible capacity for greatness. Or if you're a snob for any of the other makes or models, uh, you can all of a sudden have your eyes open. That veil lifted that uh, new homes are a machine that you could definitely consider. And shockingly, even a young breed of new home like this machine that is only 31 years old from 1989. 1989. So uh, certain makers held on to that quality a lot longer than we sometimes give them credit for. And that certainly is the case uh, with this model SL2022 that belongs to my friend Sherry uh, from the great state of Wisconsin. So stay tuned for other great premieres like this where you'll hear drum music. You'll see certain characters of the workshop maybe all of a sudden spontaneously breaking into a dance. You just never know. And uh, you'll also hopefully learn something new, uh, as you did today, uh, about uh, Janome, meaning Eye of the Snake, and also learning other cool things about machines as well. Uh, and uh, that's all part of the fun. That's all part of having this not only be a workshop, and a learning place, but also a playroom, which my new sign indicates. So uh, stay tuned for more of this. It's what we do here. It's what I do here. It's what Herr Obermeister does, what Dr. Singer does, what Mr. Bean does. 
and even His Majesty the King, once in a while, never on camera, will break into a little dance ditty. You never know. So remember, yesterday is history, tomorrow a mystery, but today is a gift, which is why we call it the present. Hang on to your present, and I hope you make the very most of it. God bless you. Thank <laughs> you.